to support this podcast, go to positivesarcasm.com slash donate. Any amount is appreciated. Once again, positivesarcasm.com slash donate. Thank you and enjoy the program. Okay, here, positive sarcasm.com. Recorded here from the spare parts studio. Some of the spare parts are breaking, but that's okay. You can always find new ones. Happy Wednesday, everybody. You can find me on Instagram at positive underscore sarcasm. Hey, po- uh, hey, Instagram, did you, did something happen where you decided to update Instagram and all of a sudden it kind of doesn't work? Like, I'm trying to do the little thing where you hit the button and it formats the, the, the video so it actually fits into the screen. I don't know what you're doing, but uh, yeah. Keep it going. You're, you're doing great so far. You can find me on Instagram at positive underscore sarcasm. You can find me on Facebook.com slash POS sarcasm or just doing frenzies. Uh, you can do Facebook.com slash positive sarcasm. I don't give a shit. Or you can just call me on my cell phone. Just call me. You just fucking call me, please. Jesus Christ. Uh, TikTok at positive sarcasm. You can email me directly at positive under at positive sarcasm. At? Oh, jeez. This fucking. Oh, my God. You know, I got a name. If you have questions or comments, just go to positivesarcasm.com and uh, and just donate and contact me there. I got plenty. There's plenty of ways. You guys know where to find me. I hope. I hope. I hope. The uh, the I had a throwaway message last week. I mean, I meant it. I generally try to mean what I say. Uh, it was just about, you know, go spend time with your family during the holidays or do whatever you want. And uh, it was just a throwaway quick minute and a half that I kind of clipped together from my last week's from Sunday's podcast. And, uh, you know, it seemed to resonate quite well with people. It's gotten a couple of hits on, uh, on, the, uh, on the YouTubes, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I stick by it. So if you guys are planning to go see somebody for the holidays and maybe you're worried of lockdown or restrictions or whatever, just go do it. Just go do what you want. Be your in, be an individual, and screw anybody who tells you different. And that's it. Um, that's all I have to say about that. I said what I had to say about it, and I, I'm good from there. Uh, oh, I have a couple. I do have an update. Oh, also, um, I was tired of looking at the Geely DVD, so I got rid of that and inserted Pink Floyd: The Wall. Um, you know, just <laughs> there's no justification for having Geely in, on DVD in this house. The uh, okay, so we're updates. I updates about things I was said I was going to do in the podcast. Number one, we're still waiting on the concrete weights. Those should be ready to go by this weekend. We'll find out more. Number two was the roasting of the coffee. Okay, so I finally got my beans in from uh, Berman Coffee. You know, and they generally they they come in like they're like greenish basically, and then you have to roast them. So I got the roaster in. I got an eight ounce rotational. So you weigh it out. It's very important that you weigh out the beans. And I, you, I did it. I have a little weigher thingy. They cost like nothing. And I got them to exactly eight ounces. My first attempt was, I obviously you go on YouTube. You go on YouTube and you're like, okay, how to roast coffee beans. And I looked for somebody who was using a similar machine to mine. And he was like, oh, I did it you know, for 180 degrees for like this many minutes and he's like okay and then he puts the instructions for if you're going to do an italian dark roast you do 245 for 25 minutes and i'm like all right well let me split the difference let me do like 25 minutes but at 240. so i did that the very first test of of roasting my own coffee beans and the first test did not go well it literally number one when he says that it roasting coffee does not smell good if you're unless you're fire roasting coffee and you're outside, roasting it indoors is not does not smell good. The first result was bad. It was super smoky. I got to about 24 minutes. No, I got to about 20 something minutes at 240 degrees and I had to shut the thing off and take the things out. They were charcoal. Now I did do I put them through the blender, my grinder to see what they look like and I can tell you right now. I do know the difference between super espresso dark roast and pure charcoal and this was pure charcoal so i had to uh throw that out so that was test number one the beans were no good so i lost eight ounces right there and it comes in it came in a three pound package so test one was bad i had to throw the beans out test number two i brought it down from 240 degrees to 
200 degrees at 15 minutes. Now, generally, people tell you when if you're roasting beans, at you put it at a certain temperature, and at first crack, when you hear the first crack or first pop, you shut the machine off, and then you take the beans out. Or you shut the machine off, and then you just let them sit. So the second time, I did a super light roast at uh, 180 degrees, or excuse me, 200 degrees for 15 minutes. Those came out super floral and rather light, but still cooked, well, still roasted, excuse me. But for somebody who likes light roasts, it, it's very floral, aromatic, and it tastes, it's almost like tea to me. I can't do it. It's too watery to me. Some people wouldn't like it, though. So it was too light. So I'm like, all right, so that's the second attempt. Those beans ended up being mixed, though, with a Lavazza dark roast, and it actually works out quite well, and it's actually very good. But I want this to be, I don't want this to be a mix. When I make my coffee going forward, I want it to be straight up my coffee, my roast, my preferences. No Lavazza, no Aroma Joes, no Starbucks or anything. I just want it to be my coffee that I'm ordering from now on and getting a hang for doing it on the fly. Like if I got 20 minutes, I can roast some beans, put them in the shaker, and let them sit for a few days while they, uh, quote, degas. Because apparently you're supposed to do that for three days for coffee before you blend it and serve it. I mean, you can do it right away, but there's the rule is, is you're supposed to let it sit for a couple days. So test number three. Test number three, I went from, I went to 220 degrees and went from 15 minutes to 17 minutes. And I stayed patient. And those beans have yet to be tested, but they look like a solid, darker medium roast. I'm pretty, I'm pretty optimistic on this one, but... We're going to wait. If I have to go like another minute longer, I think 220 degrees is the temperature I want it to be at. The timing is going to be somewhere between 17 and 19 minutes. So that's going to be my marker. So we'll start at 17 and then we'll probably see how they taste. And then we'll go, maybe we'll go a minute longer, but probably no more than two minutes. We'll see how the flavor, the flavor turns out because it, they look, they look pretty damn good. They really do look good. And this machine, and this is in the third attempt. So I've already gone through 8, 16, 24 ounces. And then the plan is to taste them. If it tastes, it, it can't just taste passable. It needs to taste really good. It needs to have a really good uh, uh, scent. Like it needs to taste like, it needs to smell like coffee. It needs to be packaged easily. It needs to be blended easily. And then if it really tastes like a coffee that I can drink on the podcast and serve to people and give as gifts, then we'll go to the next step and we'll start packaging and selling it. But that's going to be, I think, a few days from now. But overall, I think we got, I think we're on the right path. But coffee is your preference. So I've, I've tested, I've tested it at like almost max and I've tested it at minimum. And I think the lowest you can go is 15 minutes at like 200 degrees. Now you can get like a Nesco or you can, but you there, the Nesco is only do four ounces per. I know there's coffee snobs out there that swear by the Nesco, but I wanted to do more. And the Nesco is more expensive than the rotating, um, this bigger rotating, it looks like a casserole, looks like a crock pot. You can get these things for like, if you look hard enough, you can get them for like $60 a piece. So if you get like two of them, you can roast 16 ounces of coffee beans within 20 minutes. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So within 20 minutes, set a timer. Take it. You you once the once the thing the timer sets, you take it. Uh, you know, timer turns off. You take the beans out. You put them in the shaker. You shake them till all the extra shells and casings fall out, and then you just put them in a in a container and you leave them for a few days. And that's 16. So if you got two of them, you can do 16 ounces in 20 minutes. So that's not too bad. I mean, 16 ounces is one full package in 20 minutes. Perfect. And cleanup is relatively easy. I mean, this thing has like a nonstick surface and now believe me you definitely don't test the full max limit don't try to make an italian dark roast on your first attempt you will burn the beans 240 degrees is aggressive i definitely kept them in there for way too long 220 is where you want to be and i wouldn't venture past 20 minutes so but i i liked i like the progress i'm making on them i'm just fine tuning it to get a standard flavor that i would prefer to drink every single day whether it's morning or afternoon that sits well with my stomach that i can appreciate all the flavors of that i can drink with that i can drink black that i can drink with creamer 
that is not so offensive as like as far as dark roast goes because some people just can't drink dark roast they just can't but like a solid medium roast that has a very robust flavor and these are good beans these are these are a costa rican blend that um have a decent floral smell to them and i'm really I don't know. I'm, I'm just wanting to give that update. Like this, this is not as hard as you think it is. You just have to be. You have to pay attention as far as set your timer, weigh your beans, and then let the thing go. And then after your a lot of time is done, you shake them out, which takes takes 30 seconds, and then you throw them in a uh, you throw them in a container and you leave them there. And that's it. You're done. I would recommend a metal colander over a plastic colander because I don't know if it's going to melt the beans or the beans will melt. The hot beans will melt maybe the plastic. And they can also compromise the flavor of it. So go with a metal colander. But the whole process, you can be done cooking beans uh, for, let's see. You can have them cooked within, the whole process can take 30 minutes. And then you're done. And you have your own coffee beans. And then obviously blending them takes no time at all. So I will report more to you uh, once I finalize it. And then I'll start to work on the whole packaging concept. That won't take too long. Um, in the meantime, I did want to, uh, let's see, what else have we got? Okay. So obviously everybody's concerned about like contract tra contact tracing. People don't like being follow, don't like their apps, quote, following, following them. We don't want like, there are digital footprints that people are just at this point starting to be aware of that apps are tracking your location, uh, spying on you, and people are starting to go backwards as far as some of their technology. Some people don't care. They'll give away anything just to be a fucking TikTok star. But uh, if you are looking to take a couple extra steps to maybe I mean, supposedly ensure that you're not voluntarily being tracked, there was a website, uh, Brendan Hesse from lifehacker.com. Gmail, obviously, if anybody is an Android user, uh, Gmail is obviously installed on every single uh, cell phone. So... And it has a feature of, uh, of tracking. It's one of their smart features. There is a way to turn it off. Uh, let me get to the article, actually. So Google does collect, every, obviously Google collects data on everything you do using its products and services. And that the products are sold to advertisers. Now, it makes it easier to use Google products, but let's face it, with everything going on right now, and all the contract chasing, tracing and the location services, you don't know who it's being, uh, you don't know it. May, marketing to sell you socks, or are we selling this off to some non-contract government agency or some shit to track you to see if you, uh, you know, had dinner with Betty Lou and two weeks later she got the COVID? So it's best to just, like, you don't want anybody knowing what you're doing. All right. I don't see a lot of people checking in like they used to to freaking restaurants and shit. So, yeah, I will um, go into further detail here as far as, however, some people don't want their data tracked and stored. So here is the opt-out procedure. Uh, changing Gmail's data collection behavior. More on that in a second. It will soon be easier to opt out of Google's tracking thanks to a new Gmail setting rolling out in the coming weeks. Okay, so this is in the coming weeks. First, users will now have the option to disable Gmail's smart features like Smart Compose, Smart Reply, uh, and so on. While these are handy, Google has to root through your Gmail, Meet, and Chat data for them to work. It goes on to say the other settings let users prevent Gmail chat and meet data from being used in other Google apps. Just like disabling smart features, turning off personalization, remove certain conveniences like content suggestion in Google search, restaurant recommendations in Google Maps, i.e. location tracking, or automated bill pay reminders from Google Assistant. You might lose a bit of helpfulness, but believe me, you should be able to find things yourself. Uh, but you'll at least be able to keep Google out of your inbox a little bit more. Who the fuck uses Gmail? I use Gmail to send podcast articles to my email, but that's my Hotmail account, my Outlook account. I do not, that's the only thing I use it for. So other than that, that's pretty much all the Gmail that I use it for. I don't use it for anything else, not for correspondence, not for business purposes. I simply use it, um, for that, just sending emails over because I want to just get them over so I can read through them later and have quick access to them. Uh, turning off Gmail smart features and personalizations in the settings menu. Okay, so here, here's what we do. The new, these new permissions will appear as automated prompts for all Gmail users in the coming weeks. That said, if you'd rather not wait, you can change some of your Gmail data preferences in Gmail settings right now. Pull up Gmail, then visit settings, general, to turn off the following options, 
Smart Compose, Smart Compose Personalization, Nudges, and Smart Reply. So I'll be, so those are the options you have there. Next, go to Settings and Inbox. Deselect all inbox categories and turn off important markers. You can change how your Gmail data is used by going to Settings, Account, and Import. Accounts and Import. Once again, Settings, Accounts and Import, and other Google account settings. And he states at the bottom, don't worry if you didn't know these features collect your data. It's not mentioned anywhere in Gmail settings. Thankfully, the new user options are much clearer about how smart features work and how Google uses the data it has collected. So my advice to you, turn it all off and go from there. Hmm. So there is that. But obviously a little bit of tech advice is good. I don't. I, yeah, I'm not a fan of tracking, especially now. I'm, I'm doing what I can to pull back from a lot of different things. Um, and it's, ugh, I don't know. There's a lot of things I can't really go into due to the fact that it's just all, it gets into government, it gets into politics and stuff like that. And I tr I'm trying the best I can to stay out of that. I'm doing a pretty good job so far. I mean, every once in a while, I call some random governor or, male, or, or mayor a fucking idiot. But, I mean, hey, you know, uh, sorry. But, uh, actually, I'm not sorry. I don't care. Uh, I think it was, who was it, Gavin Newsom? I called the fucking idiot. Nah, whatever. Fucking whatevs. Um, all right. The New York Post. The New York Post gotten some shit a few weeks ago from Twitter for posting something, and it wasn't verified. I don't know. But this is completely different. This is a silly article, and it's kind of annoying. And it's just another thing that kind of scares people into, uh, staying indoors or not. Just kind of like, it, it seems like it's stealing your freedoms right from underneath you. So this is an article from the New York Post. It's so fucking stupid. Um, usually I'm kind of a fan of the New York Post because they are uh, they don't give a shit about what they say. But this one by Jackie Salo, I'm not sure I'm a fan of it all. And it's, it says, dog owners who walk pooches at higher risk of contracting COVID-19. This is a study. Dog owners who walk their pooches are 78 more percent, 78 percent more likely to come down with COVID-19, this new study claims. These fucking studies, man. Researchers from the University of Grenada, or Granada, excuse me, surveyed 2,086 people about their daily habits during the pandemic to assess, assess the risk of various activities, according to a paper in the Journal of Environmental Research. They found that people who walked their dogs had a significantly higher chance of catching the virus, with an increased risk of 78% to the average person. Meanwhile, owning cats or other types of pets didn't appear to put someone at more risk for becoming infected with the virus, research says. These results... Well, you don't fucking walk your cat, stupid. These results point to living with dogs as a strong risk factor for COVID-19 infection, researchers wrote. Though the, find, the findings indicated there was a higher contagion among dog owners, more research is needed to determine whether pooches play a direct role in spreading the virus. There's no conclusive research that the dogs prove... Dogs proves dogs to human transmission as possible if a dog becomes infected. However, researchers suggest pooches could spread the virus by touching contaminated services in public and then walking the germs throughout their neighbor's home, throughout their owner's home. Uh, Christina Sanchez Gonzalez, a professor, one of the study's authors, said dog owners should take extra care to practice good hygiene. She added that the decisions to close areas such as playgrounds didn't make sense when areas such as dog parks were able to remain open. Okay. In the midst of a pandemic and the, in the absence of an effective treatment or vaccine, preventative hygiene measures are the only salvation. And uh, these measures should also be applied to dogs, which according to the, uh, our study, appear to directly or indirectly increase the risk of contracting the virus, she said. All right, lady, look, you're off your fucking rocker, first of all. So you're telling me every time I walk my dog, I'm 78% more likely to contract the fucking COVID sniffles. All right, I walk my dog three times a day. So you're telling me three, I am three times, so 78%, what's the fucking math on that? That's 70 plus 70, 140, 150, I'm over 220% more likely to catch COVID, so I should have caught COVID fucking twice a day just by walking my dog. So, okay, what does that tell you? It just tells you I really, I, I fucking had it with this whole thing, I don't. Really, eventually, we're just going to get sick of it. I mean, are we going to get locked in? There's going to be some states next year that they're going to come down with a lockdown, and some states are going to be like, you know what? Nah, we're good. Fucking open up everything. Bars, full capacity. Nobody gives a shit. 
I'm, I'm going to keep, I mean, the only reason I'm going to stop probably walking my dog is the fact that I stepped outside this morning and it was like minus two fucking degrees and with like a wind chill of minus a thousand. And I was like, uh, that's it. I'm staying in. Fuck this shit. I am all set. So yeah, that's the only reason I'm, I'm going to probably stop walking my dog because it's goddamn cold out. Walks should be stress free. They should be relaxing. They should take your mind off of things. It should not be like you go outside and be like, Jesus Christ, So it's like I'm all set with that. I don't want to go and deal with that shit. I don't want to wake up and go outside and, and then all of a sudden have to come back. My face is completely red. My ears hurt. And, you know, it's it's my dog's annoying for the when you walk him because he's one of those things he likes to stretch out his leash. And then we were walking the dog today, and a fucking chicken goes running across the street. And obviously, my dog is a, is a squirrel chaser. So obviously, if he sees a chicken, he's like fucking, oh my god, it's taking me! And he just goes chasing right after it. And thankfully, I have him on his leash, which he's he's about ready to chew through. So what are you looking at me for? You fuck? No, don't you stay? No, stay, stay. We already had this conversation. You stay right there. I yell at my dog a lot. Uh <laughs> So, uh, I mean, this is, we're talking about a dog that wrote, you know, that rubs his ass against the carpet, rolled in something, I don't know what the fuck it was, and uh, chases after everything and sniffs everything and pees on whatever he can. Every pile of leaves he jumps in, uh, and, and he's the, the, after he barks at somebody for 30 seconds, he's the, nice, he's the sweetest thing in the world. So you're telling me my dog is a COVID magnet? Fuck off, all right? Take your, take your little article and your little study and your University of Granada and go fuck yourself. I'm all set. I don't give a shit. I don't. I really don't care. And when the first round of vaccines come through, no, I'm not taking it. So you heard it here first. All right, that's not really what I want to focus on. Um, this was, a, little, this was a, a bit more interesting was... When obviously New York is in a shit state right now, uh, but there was a video going around that I also found on Instagram about a man who was on top of an MTA bus. Uh, was it MTA? Well, obviously Transit Authority. He was on top of a bus. He jumped on it from a from an ice cream uh, from an ice cream uh, truck. He went from the ice cream truck and jumped onto the the bus, the New York City bus, and then proceeded to whip out a flamethrower and started shooting it up in the sky. Just randomly. And obviously, everybody had to TikTok the fuck out of it. So everybody, uh, instead of calling the police, whipped out their fucking cameras and just started videotaping the guy. Turns out he's like some shitty rapper out of, out of Brooklyn. So it's like, oh, that's great. So he whips out this flamethrower, which uh, wasn't, it wasn't too bad. It was mostly, it, just, it was like an Elon Musk type of flamethrower where it was basically just a propane tank next to a release valve. It only shot like, I don't know, seven or eight feet. There's a limit. A technical like propane flamethrower per se can only be legally go, can only shoot so far. Actual flamethrowers like the ones from like World War II, uh, those are illegal. Humans, humans, cit U.S. citizens cannot legally own a flamethrower that does something like that. Um... So, yeah, you have to take that into account. The ones you saw in, like, Vietnam, those napalm flamethrowers or whatever, yeah, those are, not, those are not legal for citizens to have. But he's just standing there on top of this freaking MTA bus and just blasts it away, shooting it up in the air and just willy-nilly, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, he, you think he's about to jump off the bus and then runs to the back of the bus, and there's somebody over there videotaping it, and then he just points the flamethrower at him and just opens the valve right up. So... I mean, I got to visit New York a couple of years ago, right before COVID, uh, about a year after, and then a COVID hit about a year later. I mean, shit was already going downhill in New York anyways, but I mean, now it's an absolute nightmare. And now apparently you've got people standing on top of buses shooting flamethrowers. So the, if there's additional information on it, a hothead with a flamethrower, a hothead, ha <laughs> I see what you did there. Jesus Christ. Yes, yeah, sparking outrage and at the MTA among police unions who say the bizarre display is the latest sign of urban decay. The incident unfolded around 5.30 p.m. November 8th on Putnam Ave in the intersection with Franklin Avenue in Be oh, Bed-Stuyvesant. Bedford-Stuyvesant was a route that my father worked as a riot cop in New York City, and that was one of the hot spots that he walked a beat through. 
Bedford-Stuyvesant was one of the no, more notorious spots for like serious felon, serious felony crime. And apparently things have, haven't changed all that much. Uh, like I said, Bedford-Stuyvesant video shows, posted to social, social media, man on top, and yeah, an unknown man, even though it was posted to his fucking Instagram, on top of an ice cream truck, truck before leaping to the roof of the B-26 bus that had stopped at the intersection. The man then fires, the fl- fires off the flamethrower, and as the crowd cheers, oh, good, it's like a Ramstein concert. As the flammable liquid from the gas falls onto the bus, it briefly ignites on top of the roof, the video shows. Great! Uh, the crowd of the onlookers record with their record the stunt with their phones as the man sends the fl- the fumes the flames bursting into the night sky. Soon after the man started the dangerous stunt, a man who appears to be on the bus to, appears, appears to be the bus driver emerges from the front door of the vehicle and watches the display video shows. The pyro, meanwhile, walks to the rear of the bus and unleashes a few streams of fire towards the street, briefly setting the ground alight before hopping off the bus. And he kind of and he when he leaped off the bus, he like fucking fell on his ass. Which is always smart when you're holding a flamethrower. Uh, the stunt was part of Wu-Tang tribute music video by local rapper Dupree G.O.D. Dupree God. Uh, according to his social media. Wu-Tang music video shoot was insane. It was a movie. It was effing epic. The relatively unknown rapper wrote on Instagram. When I was in New York, that all that's all it was was rappers pushing their CDs and looking for donations. That's all they wanted to do. Yo, here's my CD. Check out my CD. You got five dollars? Give me five dollars. I got one of them. I actually have. I did give a guy five bucks for his CD, and it's um, it's a picture of him, like the like he's he's pictured like Altair from Assassin's Creed. So yeah, that's super inventive. Uh, so I I do have one. I mean, should I play it at the end of the uh at the end of the podcast? No, nah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, as far as much to everyone who okay, much everyone. Much, this is him saying it, much, quote, much everyone to all who came out, we shut Franklin Avenue down with amazing energy, we are in this together. Yeah, I'm sure we are. We the illest video coming. We the illest video coming. Dude, fucking learn English. Uh, Several members of the classic rap group did not return requests for comment. Uh, MTA and City Hall confirmed there were no permits for the shoot. No shit, Sherlock. The rapper who did not respond to the comment... Invited people to join him at the corner for free ice cream, t-shirts, and champagne for the video for his social media. We don't even need to say how absurd, dangerous, and just plain stupid this was, MTA spokesperson Tim Milton said. The reckless individual who torched over the top of an occupied bus put New Yorkers, including the bus operator, in life-threatening peril. The NYPD said it was investigating the incident after the Sergeant's Benevolence Association tweeted out a video of the incident. NYC is not safe. You are being lied to, the union raged in the, in the since-deleted tweet. Why'd you delete it then? No injuries were reported. Blah, blah, blah. We moved to another bus to the next stop, according to the MTA. Okay, so there's, there's that. So um, if you live in New York, leave if you haven't already. If you have a house in New York or an apartment or whatever, sell it. Uh, if you have a, a business in New York, close it. Just fucking leave. Get out of New York. Go wherever you can. Go to the countryside. New York is fucked. New York is in such bad shape. More shits are gonna, more shit is gonna close there. The more counties are gonna have issues. There's gonna be more lockdowns there because the, the people who run that place are fucking retarded. So there's no reason to be there. You need to get out while you still can. Go somewhere else. If you got like a Chinese restaurant on Fifth Avenue or whatever, go open it up in like, I don't know, Westboro, Mass or something or somewhere small uh, at this point. If you have a shot, there's real estate everywhere else. So go do that. Um, there's nothing I can tell you about New York other than I think it's, uh, it's, hmm, what's a good way to put it? It's zombie. It's, it's, it's been, it's basically dead. At this point, I think there's no reason like for any city, for the most part, there's really no reason to be in one. Like they've just been they've been completely torched by this whole this whole thing. And it's not really a fault of the people who live in the city. I'm not going to blame them. They don't know any better. They're just trying to move on, with, do their thing and get their fucking lattes and go to their stupid ass jobs. It's just the people in charge of the city don't know what they're doing. Or maybe they do, and then that's a real problem. So there's that. Uh, I don't really want to go into other articles other than just the 
yeah, I just want to go right to Q and A because I've been kind of like I've only been doing like a couple. I've only done like two or three Q and A questions, and I wanted to do more, so I might as well just get right to them and then close up shop wherever we land at. So let's just go right to that. So obviously, as we reviewed today, um, we reviewed my my recent coffee update. We reviewed how to turn off your Gmail tracking information, the dog owner thing, which is bullshit. And the man who uh, would be king upon a, a top an MTA bus in Brooklyn. So let's just go right right to head in Q and A and see if we can solve some people's problems or we can make them worse. Also, if you want to go to positivesarcasm.com slash donate and submit any amount is appreciated. Donate as little as a dollar. Any of you who viewed the recent video I dropped on Instagram, Facebook, and my YouTube channel, Positive Sarcasm Podcast, thank you for uh, watching and hitting the like button if you can. Um, also go to head to my other, my other channel, positive sarcasm. Uh, there's a video there dropping 5 AM, um, Thanksgiving day. Just go ahead and hit the like and the subscribe and the notification button. All right. Enough bullshit. I'm kind of, kind of flat today. I lost 20 bucks in the stock market today. I'm kind of annoyed by that. Market was doing so well. And then all of a sudden it just went, ah, 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 shoo. And then that's it. All my fucking profits were gone. Fucking stupid. How can I deter my husband from his plan of eating 10,000 calories a day for a year because he lost a bet? Husband is a stipend PhD candidate in statistics. Means he makes a small salary in addition to paid tuition. He was so confident in his alternate, anal his alternate analysis of the polling data, he bet a friend that his current president would win the election. I had no idea that his bet was happening, but we went out to dinner on Saturday to celebrate the election. And my husband ate so much that he actually made himself sick. That night, he just said that he was super happy. But then on Sunday, he got door dashed three times and I forced him to tell me what was going on. He tried to play it off like, oh, babe, you'll get such a kick out of this. Ha <laughs> ha. I lost a bet because of the election. Because ha, I, I eat. OK, yeah. And he eats 10,000 calories a day. Guy code. Love you. I was shocked and stunned to say the least. My initial reaction was that since I'm the main breadwinner and we're still saving for a house, we can't spend $80 a day on DoorDash for one person. November 10th is the anniversary of the first time we ever had sex, so I usually get new lingerie and we have a fun night in celebration. He was so bloated and tired he could barely move and the sexy outfit I bought from Yandy just stayed in the bag. He, it made me very sad. I approached him this morning, and I admit I was very angry. I was angry, and told him how stupid I thought this was. He said he agreed, and it was very stupid, but the guy code thing, he has to do it. I'm so disgusted with him acting like a child four days in, and this stupid bet has affected our sex life, his health, and my respect for him. What can I do about this? All right. Look, I, under Look, I understand guy code. I've adhered to guy code, and actually, I think I've broken guy. I've kind of broken guy code. Have I? Yeah, most likely. Um, but the fact is, is if he's not the brain, if he's not the breadwinner, then a ten thousand calorie a day. First of all, ten thousand calories a day. Can you do it? Yes, but you have to be. First of all, you have to lift your fucking ass off to be to be able to ingest ten thousand calories a day. You have to be number one, a marathon runner. Number two, a hardcore bicyclist. Or number three, a power lifter. And I mean a power lifter. I mean like a strongman competition power lifter. You know, not those roided up crossfitters. I'm talking like legit, like those dudes who like throw like logs and fucking gallon drums over like, you know, whatever's like that shit. That's 10,000 calorie a day stuff. If he's not that, eating 10,000 calories is not healthy. Because the amount, like the amount of food you're putting in your body, your body has to process it. And since he's a doctor or an analysis person or whatever he is, he's a PhD candidate. That's not a very smart decision. So I would actually advise him from a health standpoint and from a relationship standpoint to stand down on the uh, bet. I w I would seriously. It's not. It's not healthy. Like. I've tried to do the 10,000 calorie tried to do like a t a 10,000 calorie day. I and it's not you just it's not good. It's not good at all. Like I attempted to eat that much through like calorically dense foods and I got really sick. So I would advise him to back down. Like it's just not a good idea. It's just not a good idea. 
if you're not a power, like I said, if you're not a power lifter, if you're not a, if not if you're not a strong hardcore Olympian, a, a bicyclist, or a marathon runner, you can't sustain that for a whole year. You will get incredibly ill, and it's gonna hurt your relationship as well. And it's gonna hurt your pocketbook. Eighty bucks for DoorDash? Are you fucking kidding me? I would never do that. There are far cheaper ways to ingest calories than eighty dollars of DoorDash a day. That's stupid. That's stupid. So I would advise him to just, he has to stop. He has to stop altogether for his health and for his relationship. So, <coughs> excuse me. So let's move on to the next one. Uh-oh, here we go. Do some culture shit. All right. How should I address the homophobic comments my tweet son, my tween son has been making since his dad, since saw his, wait, hold on. How the fuck? How should I address the homophobic comments my tween son has been making since saw his dad having sex with a male friend? Well, he's a tween. What are you going to do? Uh, guess I already answered that question. A few weeks ago, I was supposed to take my sons to an outdoor activity that ended up getting canceled due to weather. We found out about the cancellation when we were halfway there. Before I turned around, I texted my husband that, we'd be head that we would be heading home and never got a text back. This wasn't unusual as he usually puts his phone on do not disturb while he's working. When we got home, I opened the door to find my husband and his best friend Ryan completely naked and having fairly rough sex on our dining room table. They had music blaring so they didn't hear us come in and my sons and I were all in shock and just stood there for a good 30 to 60 seconds before I was able to shut the music off and they realized what was going on and could cover up. Obviously, this was a bit of a chaotic situation. Ryan is like an uncle to my kids, has dinner at our house several times a week, apparently, and also has dessert, has occasionally lived with us, and he and my husband actually work together. My husband and I are planning on staying together and are still trying to figure out a lot of things. <laughs> no shit! My younger son, here's the problem, my younger son, Six, is pretty oblivious and thought Uncle Ryan was wrestling to my, with my dad. My middle son, Nine, is very confused about the mechanics of what we saw, so we had a sex talk with him, but in hindsight, we made the mistake of only talking about the heterosexual sex. Well, yeah, what are you going to do? My older son, 12, is having a very difficult time. My middle son has a lot of questions that I'm not really sure how to answer. I'm not sure how much detail I should be going into and who should be leading this conversation, me, my husband, or doctor. I've been getting phone calls from my older son's school. Ever since the incident, he has apparently been making derogatory remarks about gay people using slurs and also refusing to speak to his father. They were previously pretty close. The school is threatening to expel him. We were on the wait list for an individual family therapy, but I was wondering if you got... Okay. Look. All right. All right. Let's get to the heart of the matter here. What's... Yeah. Let's, let's deal with the issue at hand. Your dad... Your father, may, your husband, cheated. Okay, I don't care who he cheated with. He cheated. He cheated. He lied to you. This obviously isn't the first time. And he traumatized his kids. It doesn't matter who he cheated with, whether it was a guy or a girl. He made a decision to be unfaithful to his wife and got caught in front of his kids. Obviously, some of the kids are confused. But obviously, the 12-year-old is upset and mad at his dad for betraying his mother. So this isn't a, a fact that he's being uh, a homophobe or making homophobic comments. He's upset that his dad was caught lying right there in front of him. At 12 years old, I cannot fault him for anything he says. He's obviously upset. He's obviously upset his dad has, has all the responsibility in the world to work through this for his son. He, he is. He's lost all credibility. He's lost all trust. And there's no, the son is, has absolutely no fault in this situation. He caught his dad cheating on his mother. So it doesn't matter whether it was this way or that way. It, was, it shouldn't have been any way. But he saw it and he lied to his kids. And now he has to repair this with his son. It's his responsibility to fix it. So if they're threatening to expel him, I mean, do this, does the school know what happened? 
You know, does the school know what happened? And so why did they expel him? Fuck it. Who cares? He's not going to learn anything in school anyways. Not anymore. Schools don't teach you shit. So whoop de doo But, yeah, the kid is scorned. The kid is scorned. And it's, the kid was perfectly fine. He had a great relationship with his dad. He had a great relationship with his mom. He had a couple of brothers. And then, poof, next thing you know, old daddy is getting fucked in the ass right there on the dinner table. I mean, how do you cognitively recover from something like that? That is debilitating. That changes everything. And it's going to take decades to resolve it. So now I'm not going to blame the kid at all for anything he's saying or anything he's doing. Yeah, I get it. He's making inappropriate comments. I was 12 years old. I, make, I made inappropriate comments. I make inappropriate comments now. What do you think? I'm going to stop? I got a podcast. It's all about making inappropriate comments. This isn't fucking hardcore history. This is the Positive Sarcasm Podcast. You think I have a shit about political correctness? No. I mean, I, I'm not gonna put I'm not gonna try to imagine my dad in that scenario, but Jesus Christ, he walked in and his dude and his, his dad was given or getting the business from Ryan, the quote, uncle. So your dad screwed up and it's up to him a hundred percent to fix the situation. So I, that's, yeah, like I said, it was nothing, the homophobia had nothing, that's nothing to do with this, nothing. It's just a, a way of your son venting his frustration for the mere fact that he caught his dad in the act of cheating. That's the big thing here, is the, is the, the destruction of the trust in the family. Now, the question is, here's the, the other thing, we'll, we'll take this a step further. Is your dad gay? Or was he just experimenting? Because if your dad is, if he's that, then how is he going to take care of the needs, most importantly, of the person he gave his vows to? His wife. They plan on staying together? Like, like what, a business relationship? You see through that shit. This isn't fun. Is this fucking Brokeback Mountain? Or is this like a, 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 like a hey, coming out party? You know, surprise, uh, I don't know, that detail has to be filled in. And if that's the case, the relationship's not going to work. You can't have a business relationship like that. That's not, that's, no, we can't pray away, you can't pray away the gay, all right? It doesn't work. I've seen that shit in effect, and it's, it's uh, sad and horrifying to look at. Somebody who's repressing their inner self is, it's, yeah, it's scary. Like, oh my God, that person's gay. Everybody knows it, except for the whole entire family, because they're super religious. So, I mean, it's his choice, but still sad. So, maybe divorce is a good idea. But the dad fucked up. The dad fucked up bad. Like, bad. So, he has to do everything he can to repair the situation. He needs to explain himself, and he needs to repair... Any relationship that's been tainted by the school, relationship with his wife, or soon-to-be ex-wife, and the relationship with his kids. He's got to do it. He's got to be honest, because he's got nowhere else to go in this scenario. So. And fuck, please re replace the dinner table. Burn that thing. Well, let's get to the next Q&A. How can I get my son to kick his father my ex, out of the house we share. I am a 58-year-old woman who shares a split-level house with my adult son. Brad lives downstairs in what is essentially a separate two-bedroom apartment with his 10-year-old daughter, although it's technically one unit. Brad and I split the rent evenly. Last year, my mother was dying, and when I went to stay with her for some time to say goodbye, when I returned home, I found my ex-husband, Lester, was living in the downstairs apartment with our son and granddaughter. Apparently, Brad and his daughter invited Lester to visit while I was away. Well, six months later, Lester is still living there with them. Lester is not a very nice person. We were married for 16 years. Well, whose fault is that? I asked Brad to ask Lester to leave. He refuses, saying that he feels bad telling him to go. I have asked Lester to leave, and he laughs at me. He says, this is my son's house. Okay. Well... I, I don't I don't know what else to tell like look 
if you don't if you don't want somebody there but you can't tell them to leave or anything like that, then why don't you just leave? Look, sometimes you just have to take your ball and go home, and it's going to be hard for you. I don't know what your I don't know what your actual issue is. Is it is he actually doing something to annoy you, or is it the idea of him living there annoying you? Or is it because the fact that you guys split rent evenly and then that you feel that somebody's freeloading off of the rent? That, that I can actually relate to. That I can actually relate to. If you, if you split rent with somebody or you have somebody in your home and then somebody else just starts sleeping over every night uh, and they're not paying any rent and they're freeloading and they're not cleaning up and, they're just, and it's just a problem, then that... That has to be uh, handled. That has to be, uh, you know, addressed. And in that case, if you guys are splitting the rent and he's just freeloading there for some reason, he's still there, then that has to be addressed to the fact that, look, he doesn't do anything. He's not contributing. He needs to go. Or this contract needs to end. And then I need to go somewhere else. That's the thing. So at the end of the day, it's still you take your ball and go home and you go find somewhere else to live. That has to be the case. Sometimes you have to do that because... Your son has to be strong, but if he if, if he's refusing because he feels bad, well, okay. Feelings aren't always the best thing. Sometimes you have to act on what's just best in general, self-preservation. So maybe you just have to be like, look, either he goes or I go because – and you, maybe not word it like that, but yeah, maybe word it like that. It, but it has to be under the right tense, be, or pretenses. Like if, you, if it's just the idea – of him living there that annoys you, that's not good. That's not good for your argument. But if he's just freeloading, that's different. Freeloading, I'm not a fan of. Uh, I do. I used to do it, like as far as like you know, you get the groceries and I'll get them next time. But the idea that he's living there and not paying anything at all, he's just hanging out on the couch. Yeah, I would just pack my shit and leave. No reason to waste. I mean, if you want to live somewhere, you want to feel comfortable living there. You want to enjoy your your time living somewhere. You don't want to be like, for example, if you lived in New York and you can't do anything, why the fuck would you live in New York? If you're living in a house and all you're doing is constantly being annoyed by the fact that you live there and somebody else lives there rent free, why would you want to continue living there? See my point? So go find somewhere else where you want to live, where you are at peace. That's that's the only thing I would care about is finding a place where you truly feel at home, where you can relax and feel safe and secure of pursuing your own dreams and adventures. That's all I would say. Let's move on to the next Q&A. Oh, boy. How can I get my husband to stop liking everything our friend's 19-year-old daughter posts on Instagram? We have close family friends with a beautiful and charming 19-year-old daughter. Yeah, you do. She is like a niece to us. Yeah, she is. My husband has made her uncomfortable twice by remarking, mm, look at Kelly. Oh, Jesus. When, he sh when, she entered, when she's entered a room dressed up for an outing or work, the mm being the sort of sound one makes in appreciation of a delicious-looking food, for example, her discomfort was clear. She turned red and exited the room both times. He's now following her on Instagram and likes every single post she puts up and posts she posts frequently. I've spoken to him about not commenting on her appearance, especially with the loud mm noise. This is uncomfortable just to read. He seems slightly mortified. Do I need to suggest he stop with the all Instagram attention? It seems kind of creepy to me, but perhaps I am seeing something that isn't even an issue. I recently received, I remember receiving unwanted attention from the middle-aged men in my teen years, so I sh could be projecting here. Look. Um... There's some creep there. There's some creep. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to stand up for him on this one. Middle-aged dudes should not be liking teens' Instagrams. It's just... Do you have... I'm, I get it. You see it, and maybe you secretly like it. Okay, fine, whatever. But do you have to, like, hit the heart button and then, you know, comment? Do you really have to do that? I don't, I don't think you... I don't think you should. I think you should kind of back off. In this case, considering that it's a close family member, I would back the fuck off entirely. And when she enters the room, you leave the room. Right now, you have, you've definitely made the situation uncomfortable, and you have to like kind of put it all down together. Chase, you are not going down that route. You were going to say, sit down. Sit down. That's fine. All right. So that is what you need to do right there. Just like, leave and don't even, don't even apologize. 
because that's going to get long-winded and weird. Just stop altogether. Stop everything that you're doing right now. And stop following her on Instagram. Stop following her on social media. Because there's nothing more uncomfortable than being blocked. So just stop it altogether. Chase, you're not getting up. You're not. No, you're not getting up. You sit down. I'm going to start off. All right. How can I get my partner to be more outdoorsy? This, yeah. My significant other and I. My significant other and I move at different speeds. I'm constantly seeking outdoor adventures, hiking, camping, multi-day backpacking trips, golfing and skiing, and staying as active as I can. My s and my senior and others perfectly content staying in to watch movies and play video games. Part of it is our jobs. So is still going out to work. Healthcare is on their feet all day and wants to crash during time off. I work at home and can't stand the sight of our walls when I finish the work day. Why do you live there then? I want to share my thirst for adventure and outdoor activity. Chase, would you sit back down? Sit down. Sit down. I don't care. I want people to hear it. Yelling at my dog. You chill. You stay. Tap your nose. Or tap your nose. Okay. Um, so let's see. Encourage them to pursue a more active outdoorsy lifestyle to their credit. So my significant other has been p trying to push themselves out of their comfort zone. But on our latest day hike, my S SO completely broke down, both physically and mentally, as the hike was too long, too steep, and too rocky. While I admit I w it was a challenging hike, we saw plenty of less physically capable hikers out on the trail. We had a bad argument, and I'm fearful of planning our next adventure. When we were younger and dating, I compromised a lot in my pri prioritized activities we both could enjoy at the expense of desire. Look, fucking look. If you want to go, if you want to go and go out and hike, then just go out and hike. Go out and hike and do whatever you want to do. And if they want to stay home, stay home. And if it hurts the relationship, it hurts the relationship. But if you guys break up, you break up. Do you want to go out and do adventures? Go out and do adventures. Go out and do what you want to do. If this person doesn't want to hang out with you in general, then that, what do you want me to tell you? People fucking break up all the time. All right? Go out and be your own person. I don't know what else to tell you. If it's, if it's, if it's just them, it's just them. Chase, would you fucking sit down? Sit down. Sit down. Not everything has to be about you, you fucking mutt. Sit down. God damn it. I'm emotionally abusing you, you fucking lunatic. Uh, you're so soft and pathetic, though. I don't know what else to tell you. All right, we're going to do one more. Fuck it. Yeah, fuck this lady and her stupid uh, hiking bullshit. How can I get my boss to stop trying me to get to postpone my vacation at the last minute? At my job, we pretty much always schedule vacations way ahead of time. So as to not conflict with other people's vacations, as to not... So that the department always has coverage. Yet lately the week yet lately the week before I am scheduled to be off, my manager asks, makes jokes about, and sometimes even pressuring me to reschedule and not take the time. When I say no, she keeps pushing. Once she asked every day for a week and got visibly angry at my refusals. There was once also a lot of why not. Uh, I know you're not going anywhere anyways. I usually travel during my vacations but COVID. Today, today she even tried to guilt trip me to reschedule as to a favor to her after all the time she spends trying to make sure the company recognizes my efforts. Frankly, I'm furious. This is time that I have earned. Yes, and you know what? That's correct. It's time you earned. You request time. You get it approved. You take it off. That's it, and you just say no. If this is a person who's constantly giving you shit and harassing you about taking time off, you fucking quit. You quit your job and go find another one. Listen, there's plenty of sh everything is a, sh a shit job. There are plenty of shit jobs out there. And you can quit and get another shit job. Because look, you quit a job, you go do another job. It's great in the beginning because you're all full of energy and I'm going to make change. And then afterwards, after a while, it turns into another shit job. And then you quit that shit job and you go to another shit job. That's how it works. So listen, this is just a job. You earn, you work hard to get paid and then you get time off as a bonus you use that time off so that you can decompress so that you're a little more refreshed or at least tolerable of going back to work otherwise it just becomes an even shittier job that your performance suffers from the fact that you can't take your time off so take your time off she gives you shit tell her to suck a fucking dick otherwise quit okay thank you very much shit jobs are shit jobs and if they get shittier you fucking quit all right do what you want until you don't want to do it anymore. Okay? Thank you very much. We're done here. All right. You can find me on uh, Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on fucking TikTok. You can find me. Um, you can find me in my uh, studio. 
which will be moving next year. And I believe next month we'll be moving into the mobile, uh, more compressed studio so that I can get ready for the move for 2021. Um, so that will be coming up very, very shortly. But until then, you can find me on social media. You can also subscribe to the podcast on my on my YouTube channel, Positive Sarcasm Podcast. Like, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell. You can also find me on all uh, anywhere where podcasts are available: iTunes, Stitcher, you know, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podcast Addict. Anywhere where podcasts are available, you can find me on there. Okay, we're done. We're done. We're done. Thank you to the thank you for dig.com for the Q and A session. The rest of your articles are dog shit, but that one at least your uh, Q and As are still pretty decent. Uh, and then if you have questions about my articles, you can email me directly posing music, questions, comments, concerns, uh, video requests, video editing requests. You can go ahead and email me directly. Positive sarcasm at outlook.com. You have questions, concerns about my coffee. If you want to order uh, quick concerns, uh, if you have questions about maybe ordering coffee in the future, you can email me directly there. That's all going to be coming. You can ask me anything about anything. Okay. I uh, hope you guys all have uh, a great, um, holiday coming up i'll probably say the same thing again in another week um and that's pretty much it so thank you guys for listening watching subscribing all the new subscribers whether it's video or audio i appreciate all of you but until then i will talk to you all on sunday so recorded here from the spare parts studio this has been a positive sarcasm presentation 